Hey everyone, good morning. Let me know if you can hear me. You guys hear me? I don't see any responses yet. Everything's working. All right, perfect. We'll start here in just a few minutes. Of course, if you have any questions, go ahead and post them up either on sticky board or uh, the chat. But people are slowly coming in, so it's good. You guys had a good weekend and ready for another fun week here. Hope my internet will stay stable. We'll see here. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and get started here. All right, everyone, welcome. Looks like look about half the class, maybe people are uh, stuck in traffic, perhaps. And when they when they do, um, second here looks like my stream's cutting out. Yeah, so hopefully stream will in place but anyway um so i want to go ahead and get started here in terms of um we had one question over here on the sticky board they're asking about the injectable versus topical testosterone yeah that is frequently used much more commonly just due to the fact that the um the oral forms tend to be pretty rough on the liver 
Um, clinically, there might be a few cases where you do that. Um, I don't know them specifically just because I don't really use a lot of that stuff in terms of my patients, mainly because, you know, they're mostly children. Um, but there may be some instances where it does make sense. But, you know, you would have to talk to like an endocrinologist or someone for that. But um, yeah, for the majority and even for like illicit use, you're going to see a lot of um, uh, illicit use might see a lot of injectables being used too, just because again, they can be rough on the liver there. All right, so Savannah is saying that uh, having some trouble with blackboards, people might be taking a minute to get in. That's okay, no, no worries there. Um, all right, so I'm gonna switch over here. So hopefully everyone saw the PowerPoint. We're gonna be getting into the first cardiology section here. I'm not worried about my internet here, but we'll stay strong. Um, anyway, so talking about uh, cardiology here, first drugs I wanna get into is going to be the uh, drugs used for dyslipidemia, hyperlipidemia. Um, and then we'll get into talking about like our hypertension meds and stuff like that coming up in the next couple weeks. So this is a pretty big section here of medications, which is why it takes us so many weeks to get through it all. Um, so, you know, we'll be kind of talking about cardiology related topics here for the most part for basically the rest of the class. So anyway, we're going to see that there's kind of two big sources of dietary fats that we're getting in. You have your cholesterol and your triglycerides are going to be coming in through uh, your diet here. We're also gonna see that there's a really big interplay between the liver producing uh, cholesterol and things like bile salts and all of that. Um, and there's gonna be kind of a delicate interplay here between what's coming in and being absorbed th from the intestines to uh, being processed in the liver and then sending out that, um, that cholesterol and triglycerides out to the tissue and coming back. So we're gonna see kind of how this whole process occurs here and make sure we have a good understanding of that. So that way we can introduce medications that can uh, interact with that and cause some, some changes there, right? You know, looking at a typical American diet, this can vary greatly depending on the person and what their dietary habits are like, but you can see sort of the amount of triglycerides and cholesterol we typically get in. Now, normally this stuff is gonna be more difficult to digest and it has to be broken down into smaller pieces, right? It has to be emulsified, so that way it can be absorbed from the enterocytes right in the GI tract there, right? And so they get incorporated into these things called chylomicrons, and that's sort of the first step here towards being absorbed. You can get an example or look to see in this picture here how this sort of works where you can have dietary cholesterol and then also the bile salts and the biliary cholesterol being sent out from the gallbladder from the liver is being used to break down this cholesterol and, and triglycerides into smaller pieces here, right? So you can see it broken down to this micellar cholesterol that can then be absorbed through these cholesterol transporters and the actual enterocytes here. And then that's where they get turned into a chylomicron. That's sort of the first step. And the first place they're gonna go to after being absorbed is straight down into the liver. And so looking at this, you can see that the chylomicrons come in from the intestinal cells and they're gonna get sent over uh, and processed through different enzymes as they're on their way towards the liver. A really important enzyme here is gonna be called lipoprotein lipase or LPL. You're gonna see that come up quite a bit and basically it starts to hydrolyze these triglycerides. And if you look here um, at the relative um, percentage of cholesterol esters versus triglycerides here, you can see that it's pretty high in the chylomicron but then as it gets metabolized through lipoprotein lipase, more and more of those triglycerides get sort of broken down and you have a higher cholesterol content, right? We're gonna get into our LDLs and HDLs and all that in just a little bit here. But anyway, so then you're gonna find that that gets taken up into the liver itself. And then once it's in the liver there, it can be utilized for all sorts of things, right? We can utilize cholesterols and triglycerides to help us make things like cell membranes. We can use them to help um, with hormone synthesis, right? We know that a lot of the hormonal precursors come from cholesterol. We know that we can use this to also to um, esterify them and, and send them out as bile salts so that way they can help break down more dietary fat, okay? That's kind of the first thing that's happening here with the dietary fat that we absorb from the GI tract. So from there, we're gonna see that things like carbohydrates and fatty acids that are also included with this chylomicron can be converted into triglycerides. That then can be sent out from the liver and into the tissues, right? This is being secreted into the bloodstream where it can then be taken up by various cells and whatnot. Um, and so this is where you end up getting things like your VLDL. And if you were to do like a lipid panel and measure someone's, um, uh, if you get a lipid panel, it'll say triglycerides, that's really measuring the VLDL you're getting there, the very low density lipoproteins that are secreted by that liver there, okay? 
Next, we're going to see that as plasma lipoprotein lipase is starting to break down more of those triglycerides, this is where we get some things called uh, intermediate density lipoprotein, which is still included uh, in our triglyceride counts here. You know, it's about half and half cholesterol and triglycerides. And then you can see that the uh, eventually gets turned into LDL, right? And this is important because this is what we think about as being our quote unquote bad cholesterol. This is what we think about as being the thing that is the main culprit for things like atherosclerosis in the vessels themselves, right? So anyway, so that'll continue to be broken up. And again, at this point here, it can be cycled back into the liver to be taken up and utilized for things like bile salts and, and all of that. Um, again, so again, it's kind of a cyclical process here. The problem we're going to run into is that we're going to see that um, if we have too much of the LDL, that's going to be the issue. It's going to lead to buildup and cause all sorts of problems for us down the line here. Um, eventually, you can find some of this LDL is taken up by things like macrophages and eventually can be secreted back out as HDL, which we know to be sort of our protective cholesterols there. So um, this will be another important thing we want to have uh, a lot of uh, in order to be protective of our patients. You can kind of see what these lipoproteins kind of look like here. They have various um, proteins that can interact with different receptors. These will be important in order for it to be taken up by things like the liver. Um, you can see sort of the breakdown here of like cholesterols and triglycerides and all of that, right? So low density lipoprotein, this is the thing we, we care a lot about for our, our purposes here. We're gonna see that um, basically this ApoB100 protein is really important. And this is what binds to LDL receptors. These are the receptors that allow for LDL to be taken up out of the blood and either into the muscle, to the fat, to the liver. And so it, as you're going to see that again, it binds to the LDL receptor itself. The thing that's important is we want to get rid of the LDL. We want to get low levels of it um, because if we have too much of it out there in the blood, it can lead to deposition in the vessels. It can lead to atherosclerosis. That's not great. So what we're going to see is, is that um, the LDL receptors, especially on the liver, they can be upregulated or downregulated based on how much cholesterol is in the liver itself. If the liver has a lot of cholesterol, it's going to say, well, I don't really need any more. I'm going to downregulate how many LDL receptors I'm expressing, and thus you're going to have more of the LDL sticking out there in the blood. Versus if you have relatively low uh, intrahepatic cholesterol concentrations, it's going to say, well, I need more cholesterol. Let me send out more of these LDL receptors here so that way I can suck up more of it out of the blood. And that's going to be a good thing for us because it means less LDL in the blood means less of it accumulating into the vessel walls, causing narrowing, causing plaques to form, causing inflammation, all that stuff there. And again, most of these LDL receptors are found in the liver. So if we can do things to try to upregulate the number of LDL receptors on the liver, and try to suck up more of that LDL out of the blood, that's gonna be a good thing for our patients. And that's ultimately what a lot of our drugs here are going to be doing. Here's an example of what this would look like. You can imagine this is a hepatocyte, for instance, and you can see the ApoB100 protein here interacting with an LDL receptor. Here's the LDL molecule itself. And so if you have a lot of these present on the cell surface, you're gonna be able to have a lot of binding here. It's then going to uh, have endocytosis occur It'll get sucked into this lysozyme here where it can be broken down and you can utilize amino acids, you can utilize the cholesterol, all kinds of things. And then once this is broken down, it can then be shuttled back to the cell surface to be utilized again. Again, if there's already a lot of cholesterol in the cells, then they're gonna be less likely to send more of these receptors to the top. They'll downregulate, and that makes it harder to suck up more of the LDL out of the blood, okay? So what we're gonna shoot for is to have more of these receptors at the cell surface if we can. Now here is a picture that kind of shows you the various places that our different medications are gonna work. Some of them will be within the liver itself. Some of these are going to be uh, in the GI tract and you're gonna find that there's gonna be trade-offs here, um, pluses and minuses for all of them. We're gonna look at what those um, different trade-offs are gonna be. So the classes of drugs we have here include our HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors. These are called the statins. So this is going to be sort of our gold standard set of drugs here we're going to look at. Um, it's easy to tell if it's a statin because it has statin in the name. So atorvastatin, fluvastatin, all of these drugs here sound pretty similar. So it's pretty easy to determine if you're dealing with a statin drug or not. We'll have a cholesterol absorption inhibitor called azetamide. We'll have a set of drugs called the fibrates. We'll have bile acid sequestrants, and then finally we'll have nicotinic acid and our PCSK9 inhibitors. These are going to be the newest class of drugs that we're going to run into here out of this group.
So let's talk about the statins first because they're going to be sort of the most clinically important out of the bunch here. These are going to be the ones that are going to be um, utilized for probably the majority of your patients you're going to run into. So as I mentioned, you can tell if it's a statin because that's statin in the name there. So lovastatin, simvastatin, pravastatin, fluvastatin, atorvastatin, rosuvastatin, and then patavastatin. There's a lot of these here because uh, this is one of those sets of like blockbuster drugs. This is one of those set of drugs where everyone realized how effective and how good they can be. And so there was a big market for them. And so a lot of drug companies tried to come out and say, hey, we have one too, and they could make some money off of that, right? So what did these drugs do? Well, cholesterol synthesis has a whole lot of uh, different biochemical reactions happening here, but one important step uh, is including an enzyme called HMG-CoA reductase. And so if you inhibit that enzyme, you're able to inhibit cholesterol synthesis within the liver, right? So I'm decreasing cholesterol synthesis, which means overall intracellular cholesterol concentration in the hepatocyte is down, right? And recall what I had said before, that if we have low levels of, L of cholesterol in the liver, then that will cause it to upregulate the number of receptors that's going to be sending out in, onto the cell surface, right? That, which means it's going to be sucking up more LDL out of the blood. So the other kind of knock-on effects you're going to see here too are the fact that we're producing less cholesterol, which means we're going to be sending out less molecules out into the bloodstream. That includes things like VLDL, which was uh, the main component of your triglycerides. So not only is this going to cause LDL receptor or LDL concentrations to go down, it's also going to cause uh, triglycerides to go down, and then sort of as an also uh, additional effect, you're going to see that HDL concentrations are going to go up. Looks like my stream is going down. All right, I shall be right back. I'm going to try to restart my internet here to see if anything will work better. All right, can you guys see me? Should be coming back here now. I don't know if you guys can uh, hear me here. Looks like I lost some of you, but that's that's okay. I don't blame you. Probably cut me off too. Anyone can respond if they can hear me. Make sure it's still working. Okay, well, I don't see anyone responding to me. Um, so I'm gonna assume it's working because it looks like it's going on my end. So. I'm gonna keep talking uh, and then we'll go from there. I have a video recording as well, so worst comes to worst, I'll post that up if necessary. I do apologize for this because normally it goes a lot smoother. I can try to. Okay, I see now. Um, sorry, my chat was not updating, so I'm gonna go from there. All right, sorry about that. Uh, again, technical issues. Uh, you know, we live in COVID time, so 
hopefully this is the worst we run into. But um, so anyway, so I was talking about statins and how they work. Um, basically, as I said, we're decreasing cholesterol synthesis within the hepatocyte. So it's going to want to send out more LDL receptors. So that way you can try to suck up more of it out of the blood. Um, and so basically it's going to have knock-on effects of decreasing triglyceride synthesis. You're going to find that there's going to be less um, LDL and you're going to have higher HDL concentration. So kind of hitting it on all aspects there, which is beneficial. Um, there's also a lot of like side benefits to the statins. And these are things that we call pleiotropic effects, or these are sort of like additional effects that are beneficial, but aren't necessarily like a part of the mechanism of the drug, right? These don't have anything directly to do with decreasing cholesterol synthesis in the liver, but we see these are additional benefits we get by using them in these patients, which is fantastic because um, this is what leads to a lot of the mortality benefits that we end up seeing in these patients when they receive them. Um, you know, some cardiologists love statins so much they just want to put them in the bloodstream or in, in the bloodstream in the in the water supply, right? Just so everyone can have access to them. Um, some of these effects include things like improving endothelial function. They include things like stabilizing plaques. They can help reduce blood pressure to some degree. Um, they help out with reducing inflammatory markers. All of these really great things that are beneficial in order to um, kind of help your patients stay alive for longer. And this is why you're going to find most of the guidelines will say that um, these drugs should be basically used for almost everyone, uh, especially if they're at really high risk for cardiovascular disease, as we're going to see here in just a little bit. Um, the kinetics of the different statins are going to be fairly different from drug to drug. Um, I'm obviously not going to have you memorize this whole um, this whole chart here, but some of the things I want you to notice here are the uh, the enzymatic reactions that these drugs undergo. So you'll see that some of these undergo SIP uh, metabolism, which this is going to be really important in terms of um, drug interactions we're going to run into. And this can be really important because of the fact that um, if you screw up these drugs and you give uh, and you cause an interaction to occur and cause levels of statins to really have a dramatic increase, you're going to run into problems. And this is going to include um, very severe hepatic issues, muscle issues. I'm going to talk about those in just a little bit. Um, but just so you know, um, you know, some of these go undergo SIP interactions, some of these do not. And so that's really important to know which drugs are most appropriate based on the medications you might be prescribing for your patient, right? So what are some common side effects of the statins here? Well, things like headache, sleep disturbances, and fatigue can be somewhat common. Um, but you also can see things like flu-like symptoms, and this can include things like some myalgias and some sore muscles, uh, which I'll talk about more in depth here in just a little bit. But you can see sort of a dose-dependent increase in liver enzymes, and so this is why it's so important to monitor at baseline what the patient's existing enzyme levels are, and then you can follow up with them, like say six to eight weeks later, try to see, sure, sure you want to see their LDL going down to show that they're actually taking it, but also you want to make sure their LFTs are not increasing as well. So that's going to be something you want to watch out for because of the fact that um, if levels are too high, you can definitely, or you have patients who have poor hepatic function to begin with, you can see um, some dramatic, um, you know, increases in LFTs, you can cause some hepatic injury. So this is where we want to be careful. Some patients, if you do start to see rises, you either have to kind of go back down on the statin dose or may want to discontinue altogether until levels kind of get back to normal. And then maybe you can restart uh, them on a, a lower dose to, potentially. Uh, as I mentioned, you can have myalgias, and then very rarely can you develop myopathies, and this can cause cases of rhabdomyolysis. This is more often in patients who have a pretty significant drug interaction or if they just can't clear the drug for whatever reason. Um, and so, you know, they'll be talking about, wow, it feels like I, I ran a marathon, but I've been on my couch all weekend. Um, or they, if they complain about tea-colored urine or something like that, that can be a really bad sign there. And so this is going to be for patients who are typically on, All right, I uh, apologize about that, guys. I know this is frustrating for you. It is definitely frustrating for me as well because I don't I hate giving you guys kind of a reduced experience just because we're stuck online. But um, anyway, I'm back right now. So let's let's continue on. So um, basically, if you do uh, have any, any evidence of muscle toxicity, this is definitely going to require discontinuation of the drug. So just FYI on that one. Um, other things you want to know is uh, drugs uh, or contraindications to utilizing the statins. And so this is going to include things like hepatic disease. So they have already like pre-existing hepatic disease. You do want to be really cautious in utilizing statins in those patients. Um, definitely, you know, use the lowest doses possible. Um, pregnancy is going to be an absolute contraindication. You do not want to use uh, 
statins in pregnant patients because you're affecting things like cholesterol synthesis and you know uh, the ability to produce new you know cell membranes and things like that they're really going to be problematic in a developing fetus so you don't want to do that and then be cautious if you have any other drugs that are going to be interacting here. Some of these I'll talk about in just a little bit. But even like we saw with erythromycin, we know that's a potent CYP3A4 inhibitor. That would be one you'd want to avoid in some of the statins that we saw on the previous slide, like atorvastatin, like uh, uh, simvastatin, that are going to be going through that CYP3A4 pathway. Erythromycin can cause a pretty significant interaction there. So these are things you want to be thinking about. Here's some other examples of CYP3A4 inhibitors, things like grapefruit juice, things like um, you know, amiodarone, verapamil. Some of these drugs we're going to talk about more as we get into more of the cardiology topics here. So some of them um, keep in the back of your mind because we'll talk about them more later on. So statins we like because they tend to be sort of the most efficacious and best tolerated out of all the agents that we have there, right? So you're going to find that... Um, for the most part, these are going to be first-line therapy for everyone unless they have a really specific contraindication to receiving it. Okay, and I'll talk more about the guidelines here in just a little bit. So next, let's look at our cholesterol absorption inhibitors. This is going to include one drug called ezetimibe. And so this is basically going to be working, instead of like the statins working in the liver, this is actually going to be working in the actual GI tract to block the enterocytes from actually absorbing cholesterol from the, the from the GI tract, basically. So you can see here, again, when you're if you're combining drugs together to treat dyslipidemia, you wanna use things that are going to be working synergistically with one another. And this could be a good example of that. If you had something like a statin working within the liver, this could also be working to block the absorption from the GI tract, uh, and that way you get some synergy there. And so typically you'll see azetamide being used as like an add-on drug as opposed to being used as a single agent for these patients here. But by reducing intestinal delivery of cholesterol to the liver, you're going to have lower intrahepatic levels of cholesterol, which is going to, again going to cause increased expression of those LDL receptors. So that's kind of the big thing there. And then overall, you're going to see some mild decreases in LDL, triglycerides, and all of that. Um, the effects are going to be relatively mild as compared to your statin. So that's just one thing to kind of note with that. Um, and then uh, as far as ezetimibe goes, it's uh, also beneficial because it kind of limits um, a lot of systemic effects because it doesn't really get absorbed systemically, even though it is being absorbed through the liver. It actually gets spit back out through the biliary tract and kind of undergoes this thing called enterohepatic recirculation where it kind of gets absorbed from the GI tract, goes to the liver, gets spit back out through the bile, and then kind of undergoes that cycle over and over again. Uh, and again here, the only one drug in this category called azetamibe or zetia. Sometimes you may see in combination with some statins. Um, and again, this is to uh, enhance patient compliance if they require two drugs. So you can see here, and again, don't you don't have to memorize the specific numbers here. I'll show you a chart later on that kind of gives you decent ideas of how the different drugs work comparatively to one another. Um, but you can see here, you know, additional benefits in LDL lowering if added on to a statin, for instance. Uh, for the most part, you're going to see that the um, uh, adverse effects are pretty mild, which kind of goes along with how mild the drug sort of works for dyslipidemia. But, um, you know, some GI-related effects, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, that sort of thing. And then you can see uh, elevations in liver enzymes with statins, so you do definitely want to monitor for that as well if you were to, say, add this on to someone who's taking semvastatin, for instance. You can see some other drugs which, which will also interact, which we'll talk more about here in a few minutes. So for instance, like the fibric acid derivatives can increase risk for things like cholelithiasis, which kind of makes sense because ezetimibe is going through that enterohepatic recirculation, it's being spit out through the biliary tract. It would make sense to have some interactions there. And we'll talk about the fibric acid derivatives in a few moments here. Um, and some other drugs can actually decrease concentrations of azetamibe because they actually can either bind them up in the GI tract and prevent them from being absorbed in the first place. That's one interaction you do want to watch out for. Okay. There's some drugs that can increase concentrations. This is relatively rare, but here's an example of a, an immunosuppressant that can actually do that called cyclosporin, but we'll talk about that drug later on. All right, switching gears. Next, we have our fibric acid derivatives. And so there's three drugs in this category that includes uh, gemfibrozil, phenofibrate, and bezofibrate. If you see FIB, so five, I think fibric acid, um, that's how you can identify those drugs here. And so these are going to be working through a uh, very different mechanism than what we were seeing before. Basically, this is working uh, on this PPAR alpha um, nuclear transcription factor. So this is actually working within the nucleus itself to actually change um, the transcription factors here. And PPAR alpha is a specific target. 
And basically what this does, it actually helps to increase fatty acid oxidation. And so overall, by doing that within um, places like the liver and then the muscle, you're gonna have overall decreases in triglycerides, right? So we're gonna see less triglycerides being sent out, so uh, that those levels will go down. And you can also end up seeing increases in HDL, which is beneficial. So for fibrates, as opposed to statins, where their main thing is they're dropping LDL concentrations, with fibrates, the big benefit here is you're upping your HDL concentrations and decreasing your triglycerides. Those are the kind of the main benefits you're going to see with these drugs here. So overall total cholesterol, you know, modest decreases here, but the big benefits are going to be these two, right? If you had a patient who had an isolated hypertriglyceridemia, this would actually be a really good set of drugs to use for them, right? Because, or if they had low HDL concentrations, but their LDL was fine, these would be the set of drugs you'd probably want to use. In terms of side effects here, um, again, you want to be cautious when using the fibrates along with other lipid lowering agents like statins or like azetamide because you can cause some pretty significant interactions. Um, certainly themselves can cause GI effects, but things like cholelithiasis and myopathies um, are a risk. So it would make sense that if you were to mix this with a statin, then your risk for myopathies go up. Or if you were to mix this with a zetamide, your risk for cholelithiasis goes up, right? So some of these kind of make sense based off of what the other drugs are doing as well. Um, these are other ones that are going to be uh, contraindicated in pregnancy. Um, be careful if they have really severe hepatic or renal dysfunction. You may need to lower the dose to some degree. And if that exists in gallbladder disease, you definitely want to avoid it because obviously this can worsen it potentially. Um, some other things we can run into, I talked about drug interactions here with things like your statins and azetamide. Some other things include like, you know, increased anticoagulant effect of warfarin, right? So if you had a patient who's on that for AFib, for instance, and then they had a fibrate on board, you could increase your risk for bleeding. So these are all things you want to be cautious with. And anytime you're adding a new drug onto a patient's regimen, you got to look up the drug interactions. You got to look up to see um, uh, what sort of interactions you may be causing because that can lead to some pretty severe side effects for your patients. So always, always, always double check yourself when you do that, okay? What is the main place for fibrates? It's certainly not first-line therapy. It's better off being used for patients who have really high triglyceride concentrations or they have low HDL concentrations. The fibrates are going to be really good for that. And so these are going to be the primary drugs used for patients who have, for instance, like a familial or genetic hypertriglyceridemia. That's where it's going to get like a lot of additional benefits from them. Uh, next up, we have our bile acid sequestrants or the resins, another name for them. These are gonna work kind of similar to azetamide, but whereas azetamide worked on the actual enterocytes and preventing absorption there at the actual cell layer, um, or at the actual um, uh, cell, the enterocytes itself. Instead, this is gonna be working within the GI tract, not with any cell in particular, but it's working with the fats that it encounters. And basically, the bile acid resins are gonna to bind to the fats, the cholesterol, all of that um, within the GI tract, and then basically prevent it from being absorbed, and then it gets eliminated out through the feces, okay? So that includes um, basically bile salts that your gallbladder is spitting out. It's going to be including stuff coming from the diet. Um, and so by doing that, by binding all that uh, cholesterol up and eliminating in the feces, you're then going to find that helps to reduce intrahepatocyte levels of cholesterol, you get more LDL receptors out, all of that. Now, these again may be used in conjunction with some of the other drugs we've talked about, but again, they're going to be pretty wimpy in terms of their effects. They're pretty mild overall as compared to something, for instance, like a, um, uh, a statin. And so as I mentioned, they're going to bind to the bile acids in the GI tract, and they prevent that recycling of cholesterol that normally happens from the gallbladder to the uh, GI tract, to the liver, and back again. And so overall, you're going to get this excretion of these out into the feces. LDL concentrations are going to decrease in the liver, and then the receptors are going to go up. Okay. The benefits to these are the fact that they have very limited systemic absorption, right? Almost none at all. And so that means you get really limited side effects. However, we're going to see that the GI effects, where the drugs are actually working, are going to be a big problem for this one. And so if you had someone who you did not want to have any sort of absorption, this would be an ideal set of drugs for them. So if you have patients who are pregnant or if they are children, um, this may be a good set of drugs to use if you don't want something working systemically. We have three drugs here. We have cholestyramine, cholestopol, and cholecephalum. So these are three bile acid sequestrants or resins. And you can see here they typically come, um, their doses are actually quite large if you were to compare this to 
something like a statin or maybe you're using you know 40 milligrams of semvastatin or something here these come as either big bulky powders or very large tablets and you can see here you're using grams of the stuff um so you can see five grams two grams things like that a lot of times they come as powders which may not be great from a uh, patient compliance standpoint because they can be quite gritty um they don't really go down as simple as a pill does and so um you know that if you have patients with like a texture aversion things like that it may not really go down very well for them so that's usually one of the big problems you run into so um, normally women mix the powders with like water or fruit juice sometimes using like like pulpy orange juice or something like that can help them mask and taste a little bit um, and timing of these drugs is really important here so you're going to see you want to take them within an hour of a meal and that makes sense because when are you expelling the most bile salts and bile acid well, that's when you're eating food and you have to start to break down some of those dietary fats. And so we also have to separate these out from other medications because one of the big things here with the bile acid sequestrants is that they are notorious for binding up other medications. They're gonna bind up just about everything they run into in the GI tract. So we really have to separate these out and that can make it uh, challenging from a uh, administration standpoint. You see here um, that um, they're not absorbed from the GI tract, which is beneficial from a systemic standpoint. But in terms of GI effects here, we're going to see the, like bloating, flatulence, fullness, constipation, all these things here, super common. So this is like the most common side effects you'll see with this uh, bile acid sequestrants and usually is a cause for discontinuation. They just feel so miserable that, you know, they, they just don't want to take it anymore. And again, if you have hyperlipidemia, you don't really feel it. It's one of those silent conditions. Um, and here you'd be introducing a drug that makes them feel worse than they started out with. And that may lead to early discontinuation, unfortunately. Um, also, this can be a problem for like pregnant patients too, because again, they're already having a lot of GI effects from the pregnancy anyway. This would be pretty, um, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, to be even a worse situation for them. They're feeling even worse after taking a medication that's supposed to be helping them out, right? Um, you can also run into some issues where you have malabsorption of fat soluble vitamins like A, D, E, and K, and some folic acid, which again, these are really important for pregnancy. So you may need additional supplementation for those patients there. And then another um, thing you're going to see is actually, while you do get overall decreases in LDL concentrations, this does increase triglycerides. So this is going to be a contraindication for the uh, bile acid resins, is if you have hypertriglyceridemia, this is just going to worsen that. So you do want to be cautious there. Okay. And these can also bind up calcium, which may lead to worsening things for patients with osteoporosis and whatnot. So you do want to be cautious with that. Okay. So as I mentioned, these are gonna to bind to all sorts of different drugs, to and warfarin, thyroid hormone, beta blockers. A lot of these drugs we're gonna be talking about in the upcoming weeks here. And so the way to avoid this interaction here is you either have to take the other medications an hour before the bile acid sequestrant, or you do it four hours after, okay? So again, timing is really important with that. So you may have your patients maybe wake up in the morning, say take all their normal morning medications on an empty stomach, and then an hour later, Maybe they eat their breakfast and then take the bile acid sequestrant along with it. And that can be kind of a good way to avoid those drug interactions. Because otherwise, if they take them all at the same time, they're just going to bind up everything and, and prevent it from being absorbed there. Okay. So what are some contraindications? Obviously, if they have high triglyceride levels, this is going to be a problem here because it can just worsen that. So that's really the biggest thing you're going to end up running into um, with these patients here. Again, they don't get absorbed systemically, so there's not really any other contraindications in just that. So um, overall, we can consider these to be the safest, but they're sort of the wimpiest in terms of their effects here. So and they're so poorly tolerated, you don't see it really used all that frequently. So um, again, maybe useful for like an additional add-on to other drugs, or if you needed to um, use this in a patient who um, really um, wanted no systemic effects, that might be a good option for them as well. Next up, we have our niacin and our niacin derivatives here. And so niacin itself is actually a B-complex vitamin, and you may even see it being marketed as things like nicotinic acid. Um, these are all kind of under the same umbrella here. And this might be good for some patients, um, and you'll see this frequently if you go look at the um, dietary supplement section at your local drugstore, if you go to GNC or something, you will see niacin and niacin derivative uh, medications are used as a dietary supplement because again it's just a B complex vitamin, it's water soluble vitamin. Um, so maybe you have some patients who want to have a more quote unquote natural remedy for their dyslipidemia. This may be an okay option for them in those cases. There, if you ever see niacinamide, this is actually not going to be good as an antilipemic. So that one I would want to avoid. But if you see nicotinic acid, niacin, those are all going to be totally fine there. 
And the big thing here is you're going to find there's immediate release niacin and there's going to be extended release niacin. Okay. There's also going to be forms you can get as a dietary supplement, which you can buy over the counter with no restrictions. And then there's going to be the actual prescription strength variety um, that you will be able to get from a prescription from a pharmacy, right? Um, remember that um, there are some big differences in regulation between prescription drugs and dietary supplements. And I'm not going to be one person to say don't ever use dietary supplements because I certainly think they have their place. They can certainly be effective. They can also be dangerous depending on the drug interactions you run into. However, one of the things you're going to find is that with uh, prescription products, if something says this is 500 milligrams of something um, from the FDA's regulations, like they have to be able to show that that actually has 500 milligrams in it, right? So they have to be um, very clear in their labeling and they can't make false claims like this contains 500 milligrams and it really doesn't. That restriction is not so with dietary supplements. So if you go and get the bar, you know, bottom shelf bargain nice and it says that has this much nice in it you may not actually be getting that much in it right and so there can be issues between batches you can find some inter batch variation there so be careful and just let your patients know hey there can be some variability you know in some cases you sometimes get what you pay for so it's okay to go with like a more recognized name brand and i always tell them to be consistent make sure you're always getting the same brand every time whether it's nature's way or whatever you get um, stick with the same thing so that way it, you're at least hopefully getting a consistent product from batch to batch and that will give them a consistent effect so it's my little piece there on dietary supplements i think they're perfectly reasonable but just again make sure patients are being um, open and honest with you when you're asking about them because if you come across as very judgmental um, like oh you don't take dietary supplements do you those things are all those things are all crap. Um, that's not really a good way to open up a dialogue with your patient, and they may, may be less likely to tell you what they are taking, and that's really important because there can be some like significant, almost deadly interactions that can occur here, right? So what the um, niacin and niacin derivative drugs doing here? Well, basically, they're overall are decreasing free fatty acid uh, metabolism here, or release from the adipose tissue itself. And so overall, you're gonna see um, that this is going to lead to decreased synthesis of triglycerides in the liver, which is help, going to help us lower our VLDLs. So another big effect you're going to see out of niacin, and this is very similar to the fibrates, is lower triglyceride concentrations. And then downstream of that, you're going to see higher HDL concentrations. So these actions are very similar between niacin and the fibrates here. So Liz is asking, do you have another go-to drug for pregnant patients aside from the bile acid sequestrants because of the side effect profile? It's a really great question. Um, you know, you have to take the um, kind of the good with the bad in that situation there. So again, what is the risk of having high cholesterol concentrations for your pregnant patient? If they're, you know, say 25, that carries much different risk than if they were, say, close to 40, right? In terms of risk, um, can their hyperlipidemia be managed by diet alone, right? Or, you know, and again, I think the best drug for most pregnant patients is no drug, right? If you can limit exposure, even if it's something considered relatively safe, again, less drug is always better for those type of patients because um, you never know what could happen to a developing fetus. So I say that if you can get it with diet alone, diet and exercise, that's going to be the best ticket for you. If you still need some additional benefit and there's a really compelling reason to treat that dyslipidemia for whatever reason, then yeah, the bile acid sequestrants are really your only go-to. Um, all the other ones either have not been extensively studied in pregnant patients, we just don't know what the effects are, or we know they have definite deleterious effects like your statins. You just cannot use those in pregnant patients because they will cause fetal congenital issues, fetal demise, and you know, things like that. So um, again, pregnant patients can be quite challenging from that standpoint there. Anyway, getting back into nice, another way to show this is that overall we're getting less mobilization of free fatty acids from the adipose tissue, so they're hanging out there, and so you'll get less triglyceride synthesis, which is leading to less VLDL. It'll have an okay effect on LDL. It's not going to be super great compared to like a statin, but you will get increases in HDL. So again, like fibrates, triglycerides and HDL are the big things you're going to see effect on here with the niacin products. Um, now, as I mentioned, uh, I showed immediate release versus extended release. I normally don't make a distinction between those, but here it is important because you're going to find that with the immediate release products, we're going to have a particular side effect that is much more prominent than what we're going to see with our extended release products. And that includes the flushing. 
So one of the things you're gonna find, especially with immediate release nice, in which it gets very high peak levels very quickly, is you're gonna find that there will be an increase in prostaglandin synthesis. And prostaglandins we know are inflammatory, they tend to cause vasodilation, so patients will get very flush, they will get very sweaty, they will throw up, it almost looks like a heart attack in some cases, they just look bad. Uh, I had a set of friends who were uh, classmates in pharmacy school, and they were on a rotation one day, and they decided that they wanted to see what it was like taking immediate release nice. And they took a whole bunch, probably super therapeutic dose, and they looked miserable. I think they spent the afternoon throwing up, and they were just sweaty and hot and flushed, and it was miserable. I'm glad I did not help participate in their uh, their experimental trial there. But main point being is that a lot of this is due to this prostaglandin synthesis, and so that can be mitigated either by using an extended release product one that has a very slow release throughout the day, or if you can pre-medicate with something that blocks prostaglandin synthesis. And we've already talked about drugs that do that, and that main one is being aspirin. So if they can pre-medicate with aspirin maybe like an hour before, this helps to mitigate those flushing effects you can see with that, right? Or just use an extended release product. Um, other things you're gonna find here includes, you know, uh, GI effects uh, seen with these drugs here. You're gonna see um, increases, uh, possible increases in LFTs, which again, you wanna be careful for mixing something like niacin plus a statin. Um, and you can see increases in glucose and uric acid levels. So this can be bad for patients with either like preexisting hepatic disease, uh, if they have diabetes, if they have a history of gout. So you do wanna be cautious there, make sure those other things are sort of in check before initiating something like niacin therapy, because it can worsen that, okay? So in terms of absolute, Contraindications, obviously chronic liver disease would be one you'd want to be very cautious with here. And then as I mentioned with relative contraindications, you know, history of gout, if they have history of diabetes, things like that, you do want to be cautious here. So mentioned with our statins, again, niacin can worsen the effects there of statins, so they can worsen uh, increases in LFT, so you do want to watch out for that. Um, with bile acid sequestrants, they can actually be bound up by niacin, or the, the bile acids can actually, bile acid sequestrants can bind niacin, I should say, and decrease levels. And then actually, interestingly enough, if you combine this with ETOH or ethanol, it can actually worsen the flushing. So it would not have patients take niacin along with alcohol. Again, you think, well, who would do that? But I mean, there's some patients who they wake up in the morning, first thing they do is grab a drink. Um, so that can worsen the side effects there. So you would avoid that. So this is going to be better for patients who are either using niacin as an add-on therapy, if they're looking for something that is not prescription based, because they want to go with a more sort of natural sort of thing there. I think the stream's going down. Sorry about that. Um, you know, so as I mentioned, uh, niacin's better if they want something a little more natural. If they want something to get without a prescription, then again, go with a reputable, you know, dietary supplement brand. Um, or if they want to use this um, to get their triglycerides down, HDLs up, then niacin again is a good drug for that. Okay. And again, you can see combinations here. You can see things like, you know, Lovastatin plus niacin. Um, again, you have to watch the dosing there because you can see the, the niacin actually worsening side effects from the, the statin. So again, this is something you want to watch for baseline LFTs and then watch for follow-up. So check them again in four, six, eight weeks, something like that to see kind of where their LFTs are going. All right, the last set of drugs we have here are gonna be what we call our PCSK9 inhibitors. These are gonna be uh, the newest class of drugs here, and they include two drugs called alirocumab and evolocumab. And if you notice here, these are gonna be monoclonal antibodies. Anytime you see MAB at the end of a name, that means it's a monoclonal antibody. It's um, something that's engineered to bind to a specific target. So for instance, if you're watching the news, you know, the president was recently diagnosed with COVID, he got an experimental monoclonal antibody that was designed to uh, decrease the actions of COVID virus, right? So <clears throat> we can use this for all sorts of things, right? We can use these to treat uh, drug overdoses, we can use these to treat um, snake bites, we can use them to treat all sorts of things. So you'll see them use, used a lot for like things like rheumatologic conditions and things like that. You can use monoclonal antibodies for anything you want to bind to and neutralize essentially. So in this case here, there's an enzyme uh, called PCSK9. And so basically by giving this drug, you can prevent PCSK9 from doing its thing. And so you ask, well, what does PCSK9 do? Basically it's responsible for processing hepatic LDL receptors. What that means is, is that normally you'd have LDL receptors being expressed at the hepatocyte uh, cell surface, and then eventually they'll get metabolized and get eliminated. 
Well, that enzyme that's responsible for that is PCSK9. So if I get rid of that, if I decrease the activity of that enzyme by binding it up with an antibody, then that means those LDL receptors don't get metabolized. Well, my internet is just not really working out for me today. So anyway, so if they have PCSK9 being neutralized by these antibodies, it will then um, help to have higher numbers of LDL receptors expressed at the cell surface, and then that will cause more LDL to be sucked up out of the bloodstream, okay? You can have pretty significant reductions here in LDL by, by you know, over 50% in a lot of cases there. So this is a good set of drugs. Um, but again, the problem though, or the fact that they are monoclonal antibodies, there's some drawbacks to that. So some of the big ones being that they have to be injected. They cannot be taken orally because of the fact that proteins would get destroyed in the GI tract. Um, they're also gonna be very expensive because they are engineered proteins. So that again, leads to some big costs associated with them. And then also these are gonna have a higher risk for hypersensitivity, right? Anytime you inject a foreign protein into a patient, they have a, a potential for a reaction where they can have a, an immune reaction to it, causing anaphylaxis. So this risk will be higher than you see with many of the other drugs because they're all just simple chemicals as opposed to this being an actual antibody that we've engineered, okay? That risk for hypersensitivity is going to apply to any drug that's a monoclonal antibody, any drug that ends with MAB. So just something to note there. So overall, you can kind of get a decent feel for the effects of the different drugs here. I don't care that you know the specific percentages here so much as I care about, you know, the general trends. So for instance, like in terms of statin effects, like LDL is king here. This is going to be one of the best things you can have in terms of redu reductions of LDLs. Um, whereas things like resins, you're going to see potentially increases in triglycerides. That's sort of a unique thing there. Um, for fibrates and nicotinic acid, again, you're gonna get big decreases in your triglycerides and increases in HDL, some of the strongest effects here. So kind of know, based on the patient's lipid profile, kind of what the best drug might be for them at the time, depending on some of the other compelling indications they have as well. And you can see here how um, we could actually calculate total cholesterol. It actually includes the VLDL and IDL. The basic way we get that is um, to measure your triglycerides. You can take your VL or triglycerides divided by five, and that gives you a rough estimate of your VLDL concentration there. Um, now, the way we used to treat hyperlipidemia was based off of the guidelines called ATP3. And so they actually were shooting for specific LDL targets. They would say, you know, okay, let's get your LDL under 100. Let's get your HDL up above 40, above 60 in some cases, which is even better. Um, nowadays, though, we don't really care so much about the specific numbers. What we do care about is getting patients um, the effects of statins on board to try to get all those additional pleiotropic effects that help to keep those patients alive for longer, right? If you actually look at the studies regarding statin therapy and things like that, the studies are quite large, they include a huge number of people. So they have pretty good evidence for their use here. So the newer guidelines are trying to say, well, instead of just shooting for a number, let's try to overall reduce the risk for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease in these patients here. So that way we can get rid of, uh, have fewer heart attacks, have fewer people dying, and overall increase the health of these patients here. And so as I mentioned, instead of shooting for a specific number, we want to try to identify the highest risk patients and then initiate in them either moderate or high intensity statin therapy. So again, the go-to drug for these patients is gonna be statin therapy, nine times out of 10, okay? Always go with the statin. Um, as I mentioned, instead of shooting for an LDL target, we'll still look at LDLs, but we wanna make sure that we're uh, looking at that for compliance purposes, right? If you are taking high dose statin therapy and you don't see any drop in their LDLs, it's not because they didn't respond to the drug, chances are they're not taking it. So that's why we do that for um, uh, the purposes of monitoring to make sure they're actually being compliant with their regimens here. So we found in studies that there are four main groups of people who have major benefits from statins. And that includes people who already have clinical ASCVD, or that's atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. They've had a previous MI. If they've had, uh, if they have angina, if they have peripheral, peripheral vascular disease. All these things here showing that their vessels are starting to develop atherosclerosis, showing that they have those plaques there. Those patients will definitely benefit from statins. If you reduce mortality, it's great. Other people who are at big risk include, or who are at big benefit for statins include those with elevated LDL concentrations, so like greater than 190, which is fairly elevated. We're gonna see patients with diabetes who are in this age range between 40 and 75, who also have LDL concentrations, which I mean, almost any patient with diabetes is probably gonna be somewhere in this range. And without cardiovascular disease, because we know that diabetes itself is also another risk factor for 
um, cardiovascular disease, right? So that they would definitely benefit. And then individuals who have a clinical ASCVD or diabetes, or without either of these two, and they have an estimated 10-year risk greater than 7.5% of developing ASCVD, okay? So if they have diabetes, chances are they're going to require a statin, okay? If And they're, if they're 40 to 75. If their LDLs are greater than 190, they're going to need a statin. If they have evidence of ASCVD, they're going to need a statin. And then if they lack any of those other things, and they have a 10-year risk greater than 7.5%, then yeah, they're going to need a statin too, okay? Those, all the people are going to benefit greatly from having statins on board. These same benefits you're not going to get with things like niacin, with things like um, fibrates, right? And you can see here kind of a flow chart of determining who is going to be at risk and how you can manage those patients here. And so, again, I'm going to be asking more broad-based questions in terms of, like, who are the people who do get benefits from high-intensity statins or moderate intensity? Um, or to be very clear if I ask you a test question in terms of, like, who could benefit here. So I'm saying, oh, you have a diabetic patient who has a, you know, LDL of... 200 and uh, angina, you know, what are they going to benefit from? Like, well, you should be able to identify statins going to be pretty good for that patient there. You can see here, you know, looking at this, um, you know, automatically if their LDL is greater than 190, they need a high intensity statin right away. And I'll show you the differences in the statin therapy in just a little bit. You know, if their diabetes age 40 to 75, well, they can go maybe with a more moderate intensity. So that's going to be some of the delineations here you'll find based on the guidelines of saying, okay, well, how high risk are they? Obviously, they have really high levels of LDL, then yeah, they probably need a higher intensity statin to get that under control there, right? Um, and then if, if they're greater than 75, that one's going to be kind of cautious because again, the older you get, the more likely they are to have hepatotoxic effects from statins and things like that. So you do want to be careful. Now, the more tricky way it actually works out is if you have someone who's like greater than 40 years old, you know, between 40 and 75, you know, the LDL concentration, most people will be somewhere in this range here. And they're without diabetes. This is where you have to do that risk strat um, uh, stratification here. So if they're low risk and you just emphasize things like dietary um, uh, modification, get some exercise, things like that, right? So, um, but if they're a higher risk, this is where you want to start considering adding on statin therapy to get them under control there. So kind of check that out and, you know, kind of see if you can make heads or tails of it in terms of seeing like, okay, well, how do I stratify patients in requiring statins or not? And again, if you can fit them into one of these four categories, yeah, they're going to need a statin. So, and then if they have uh, clinical ASCVD, you can also kind of then break them up into, okay, what kind of risk are they at? What do you do for these patients here? And again, you think about what do you do if you're already on a high intensity statin? What do you do after that? And so that's where you can start to consider adding on secondary drugs here, right? So this is where you can start to consider things like azetamibe. You can start to consider things like, you know, potentially a fibrate or something like a PCSK9 inhibitor. Um, but generally speaking, Unless they have a really severe contraindication to a statin, they need to be on a statin first line, okay? And again, here's an example of how we can actually calculate out someone's 10-year risk. Um, so here's, um, you know, basically putting in, you know, things like their gender, their age, their ethnicity, all of that can be really important in determining overall what their risk is. And again, if they're greater than 7.5%, they probably need to be on a statin. So especially if they're like a smoker, if they have diabetes, if they're male, all these things here are going to negatively contribute to their risk. And so this can be elevated, and so they're going to require something. So this is the other thing I wanted to focus on here in terms of like what you can consider to be high versus moderate intensity. Um, you know, in terms of moderate, really the big thing here is you can use any of them, but your dose is what's going to matter here. And I'm not going to ask specific dosing questions on the exam, but in terms of high intensity, only two of the statins really fit into that. And that includes a torvastatin and rosuvastatin. Those are going to be your most bang for your buck statins there. And again, the higher their risk, the more likely they are to require one of these two. Um, the other big thing to consider, too, are the drug interactions, right? So, for instance, if I have someone who's taking a CYP3A4 inhibitor, I do not want to give them simvastatin or atorvastatin, for instance, because I know that's going to cause elevated levels of the statins, and that can lead to myopathies, can lead to hepatotoxicity. Not great. Versus if I have someone who um, is on one of those interacting drugs, well, rosuvastatin doesn't go through 3A4, so maybe that's a good option for those patients. So those are the things I want you to be able to delineate between see where your contraindications are and what your best options are going to be for that particular patient, if that makes sense. Anyway, as I mentioned, so you select an appropriate dose based off the guidelines. Make sure you're looking for drug interactions there and then seeing what your patient can tolerate. If they can't handle the high dose statin, then you can try to back off on it to see what they can tolerate. And then again, you're monitoring the LDL as well. And if the LDL is not really getting under control with what they can tolerate, that's where you consider adding on something else, right? Zetamibe, adding on PCSK9 inhibitor, those sorts of things there, okay? 
keep all those drug interactions, keep all those side effects in mind uh, when those patients are taking these medications, and that'll get you most of the way on the test, right? Um, so that's it for this section. It's relatively short uh, as compared to some of the other stuff we'll get to, but um, you know, with my internet connection being what it is, probably good that this was a short uh, topic here. Um, do you guys have any questions before I let you go? We got work on grading those uh, prescription assignments, which I think was due probably yesterday because I saw the emails flooding in. But otherwise, um, you're free to go, and I will see you next time. But I'll wait for any questions here for a few minutes. I don't see any questions. I'm going to go ahead and end the stream. But uh, if you guys have anything, feel free to email me and I'll uh, see you guys next week.